Hello, warm welcome to this talk. It's Sunday the 23rd of April. Now, of course, we've pretty well moved on now from the uh, SARS coronavirus to COVID pandemic. It's just in an endemic stage. But I thought it'd be really interesting just to review what the latest data is on the clinical features. So if you're wondering if you've got COVID or not, and for most of us, it's now a fairly minor infection, um, I want to go through those features now, but also on this video, I want to sort of reflect a little bit on the pandemic and, and how well or badly we've done in a couple of areas. But let, let's start off with the uh, the clinical features first of all. Now, uh, these are people that have tested positive for COVID. Now, um, for people that test positive with symptomatic COVID, people that are symptomatic, we notice that 68, nearly 62% of them have a sore throat. So very typical sort of common cold type feature with a sore throat. Um, 56, nearly 57% have a blocked nose. Again, classic common cold features. So if you've got a sore throat, blocked nose, yeah, could well be COVID. Uh, runny nose, 53.77%, uh, just under 54%. So we see these annoying features and for the vast majority of people, thankfully, nothing too severe. Still a very small minority of people getting severe disease, but these are virtually exclusively people with significant comorbidities or, or, or the uh, uh, very older uh, group of people. So we see these annoying features, this common cold type features. It's a COVID cold now in the, all of these, the vast majority of these cases. Um, half of the people getting headache who test positive with symptomatic COVID. Again, very common in headache. Very common in common cold head headache features. Cough with no phlegm. That's what we call a non-productive cough. Basically getting on for 50% again. Again, very common cold type features. Sneezing, <laughs> we're all very familiar with. Again, just under half. Cough with phlegm that's uh, productive. Uh, that's 40%. Um, and typically what happens with upper respiratory infections is that the cough will become because of the irritation and, and then it will become productive later as, as we clear the excess sputum away from the respiratory passages. So again, nothing really out of the ordinary here at all in terms of common colds. Hoarse voice, of course, because it can affect the, uh, the vocal cords. Muscle pains. These are more. This is more a systemic feature. But again, when you ever have a viral infection, being generally achy and under the weather is again very common. So basically, twenty eight percent with muscle aches, altered smell. This is a a, a more unique uh, COVID uh, feature. A uh, people's sense of smell uh, is different, and they smell things not as they would expect them to smell. Again seems to be reversing in virtually all cases but but strange and inconvenient for a period of time dizziness and lightheadedness again common in any infection um, eye soreness again very common in colds swollen neck glands not so common in colds swollen neck glands more common in uh, bacterial upper respiratory infections but we get this with covid fatigue again fatigue any any Viral infection can cause fatigue, but that is particularly characteristic of COVID, as indeed is the, the well, the loss, no, the loss of smell actually can be both. So the, the altered smell is more specific to COVID. The, um, the general loss of smell, again, can be uh, anything. So we see altered smell, swollen neck, glands, fatigue, <clears throat> more specific to COVID. <clears throat> All of these others, very common, common cold type features. Just to finish off a few more, earache, uh, 16% get earache, chest pain and tightness down to just under 14% now, so that, that's good. Um, shortness of breath, 13.27%. Joint and shoulder pain, 126 and uh, uh, joint joint pain in the hips, uh, 11%. Interesting, affecting the major joints there. Now, um, they were the main symptoms. And I want to just finish off on what, what is happening on, on uh, prevalence. We probably won't report this much after this because it really is endemic and is, is not too relevant. There's so many other health-related topics to discuss, uh, some of really quite quite profound importance for our futures, actually. Well, what could be more important for our futures than health? It goes without saying, really. Um, but let's just look at some um, some figures here. Now, the, these are from the uh, the Zoe Health Study. 
And these are symptomatic cases of uh, COVID. So we see that the R value is about 0.9, probably getting on to one. So at the moment, uh, and this is bang up to date as of the 22nd of 20, 23rd of January, bang up to date, 23rd of January. We do see that the uh, the prevalence is going down now slightly in terms of symptomatic disease, but this is confirmed by by testing. But of course, the number that this is coming from now is much smaller because most people simply aren't bothering to test. Why, why, why would you for, for what is essentially just an irritating cold? So that's why we see that these uh, these coloured in error bars are, are greater now because the data has this uncertainty due to the smaller number of people that are testing. But we still see it, it's still carrying on. It's circulating as as we would expect, of course. Now, this is the latest information from the Office for National Statistics. Now, um, this only goes up to the 24th of March last year. So this data is a month old because basically the Office for National Statistics stopped testing for it stopped its COVID survey. So I think we can say that the end of the pandemic in England, um, all of the UK really was probably the 24th of March 2023 because that's really when um, the ONS stopped testing. So that's probably as good a time to say it's the pandemic's uh, essentially uh, um, uh, over and we're now in an endemic stage. But we do see, it's okay, it's a little lower than this now. If we, if we look at that, the, the, the prevalence has gone down a bit of late. But we do see, you know, we're around about 2% of the population infected at any one time. And if you work this out as the whole population, it means, in terms of probability, we're all uh, going to be uh, testing positive, if we tested, for COVID once or twice a year. And this could carry on for some time. Um, and of course, when you're re-exposed, that's going to re-stimulate the mucosal immunity. And re-stimulation of immunity and development of immunity, of course, is a good thing. It, inevitable, inevitable, because we live in this milieu of viruses and sars coronavirus 2 has become another one of these viruses now. Um, so uh, that was that. Bear in mind, that data is now a month old. Uh, this is bang up to date. This is the uh, health uh, study Zoe uh, health data again and we see okay that 0 to 17s were higher here depending on schools and behavior but we see basically spread across the age continuum but continues consistently older people testing positive less um hard to see why this should be really why, why older people are getting less symptoms we can only assume it's due to very significant of the build-up of immunity that most infections in older people are now asymptomatic. They simply don't get the symptoms, which of course is excellent. We've followed this slide for quite some time. Very interesting. The blue line are uh, symptomatic colds caused by SARS coronavirus 2, and the orange line is common colds caused by all of the viruses. So at the moment we see that you know, if you get a cold, it could well be COVID, but it's more probable to be an ordinary probably rhinovirus or one of the other one of the other coronaviruses that cause common colds that's quite interesting now this this is really quite profound this next slide to me because it really covers a lot of the the pandemic um in terms of the uh, ons this is ons data testing so the alpha wave here um the uh, delta wave here and then the omicron wave here and the key thing I want to point out here is while there was a lot of cases with Alpha and um, with uh, with Delta, and of course before this was the Wuhan wave, and we really you know the testing wasn't really established then, so it's harder to tell. Um, but you know probably not massive numbers of people um, affected. A lot, a lot of a lot. Of, so many of you have actually written in saying think you think you were infected in late nineteen, uh, early twenty, uh, and we'll probably never know fully the answer to that. So it's it's kind of interesting. But um, there we have the alpha, there we have the delta, and here we have the Omicron. Now, this is the BA1 spike in Omicron, and this is the BA2 spike in Omicron. Now, before this, it's important to note delta was going up in prevalence. And delta did make people sick because effective treatments for the virus weren't being implemented. And, and delta did make people sick. And if Omicron had not come along and outcompeted Delta, then a lot more people could have got sick and a lot more people could have died. But then Delta, uh, then Omicron comes along and completely replaces Delta. 
And we see this in terms of percentage of the population. So this is at any one time, what, almost 8% in the BA1 wave uh, infected and there the BA2 wave, 6% with Omicron. And here we kind of see a blow up of that. So it's really Omicron, in my view, that saved us from Delta. Not really vaccination, because we know that vaccination doesn't in any significant way, in no significant way does it stop the spread of the infection. Um, the reason that we're in this stable endemic stage now is, is become, because of Omicron. So isn't it fortunate <laughs> that Omicron came along to take away the really quite pathogenic Delta? Interesting point for reflection there. So some people might say it's divine providence. Some people might say it's a, it's a quirk of uh, natural organic evolution. It was certainly remarkably fortunate, I believe, for all of humankind. Just imagine, if you, you think about China, for example, that wasn't really prepared for this. There was some vaccination, um, but we know the vaccines now don't effectively prevent the spread of the disease. Imagine if China had been infected, as it was, sort of the, the end of 2022, with Delta rather than uh, with Delta rather than with uh, Omicron. So China was infected entirely with Omicron. If it had been Delta, if Delta had still been the prevalent uh, strain there, the death rate in China would have been way higher than it was, way higher than it was. So it's just incredibly fortunate, really, for the vast majority of people that Omicron came along. Again, just finishing off the Office of National Statistics data, we're down to about 30% of people in hospital for COVID rather than with COVID. And uh, talking to colleagues in hospitals at the moment, we could say that essentially all of these patients have significant co comorbidities or are in the much older age groups. And finally, let's look at um, antibodies. Again, this is the end of the ONS data from March uh, 2023. Uh, this is the age 35 to 49. We see that 93% had antibodies above. Uh, the 93% antibodies here is above the 179, 179 nanograms per mil range of antibodies. Fewer people had uh, antibodies above 800 nanograms per mil in this range. So we can see that this 68, 66.8% basically um, in that age range fewer are vaccinated, but basically most of these are because of natural infection. And what the Office for National Statistics has consistently let us down on, and um, I've, I've, I think it is, I think it's fair to say they have let us down, is their antibody testing and not differentiating between vaccine-induced and natural infection-induced immunity. And question marks really still need to be uh, resolved about why that is the case. So what, anyway, what we're seeing there is 668 had the infection probably fairly recently. 93% had it a while back. The actual a number of people that have had the infection overall is going to be higher than this. It's going to be well over 99% based on previous data because antibodies wane and they're simply not picked up anymore. And just to give one other age group as an example here, this is the um, 65 to 69 year old age group. So again, above the 179 uh, nanograms per mil antibody level, 98.8. Above the... Um, 800 nanograms per mil, just over, just under 90% of people uh, testing positive. But again, this does demonstrate waning, but this does illustrate relatively recent infection or in this age group, perhaps more uh, vaccination due to the, um, the autumn vaccination uh, campaign that was in my country. So we see very high levels of immunity, and while the Office of National Statistics doesn't tell us, we can assume that a lot of this is natural immunity. So there we go. The, that's the last one for the Office of National Statistics, <laughs> having reported on them for a oh, good two and a half years now. Uh, last report, 24th of March 2023. UK prevalence from the ZOE data, one in 60. Again, indicating that we're all being exposed to this perhaps once or twice a year. And for the vast majority of us, it's an inconvenient common cold type uh, syndrome. So that was the um, SARS coronavirus 2 pandemic. As I say, much more to talk about in terms of health in general. Um, we might look at things to do with the atrogenesis, for example, things caused by medical treatment, iatros being Greek for doctor, and uh, many other important health issues. But I think that's um, 
probably the last review video we'll need to do on on the uh, SARS coronavirus two pandemic. So um, yeah, time for reflection. Time to move on. Time to think about other problems of the present and the future. And thank you for watching.